Um, right. Uh, well, maybe um, I will get started. And of course, as I'm giving my intro, I imagine a few people will still be joining us. Uh, but that will uh, that will give it a little bit of time uh, before we move on to our invited guest. So welcome everyone, a uh, very warm welcome to the Department of Visual Culture's public program. This is our second session in the Field Reports series that Yorella Andrews has organized this term. And I'd like to really thank Yorella for all of her organization work on this lecture series. It's been really interesting so far, and I'm sure it will continue to be so. The purpose of this lecture series is to give a glimpse of the various research streams and uh, research clusters and activities that are happening in and around the department, and to give a sense of the diversity of the research streams that are happening within uh, the Department of Visual Cultures. I'm really thrilled today that uh, we have Gargi Bhattacharya joining us, who is a wonderful scholar who has focused on race and racisms and recently race capitalism and life in austerity. And uh, I'll be um, turning over to her in a little bit, but first of all, I just had a few points of housekeeping. So first of all, if you're on this call as, a, um, as an audience member, you are probably muted already. But just in case not, uh, please do make sure that you are muted, just to make sure that the quality of the sound on the stream is as good as it can be. Um, we'll be taking questions after um, our invited speakers have, um, have spoken. And we'll be doing that over the chat. So please feel free to use the chat to note your questions at any point. And also you can um, just put in that you have a question. So you don't necessarily have to write out your full question, but you can just indicate that you have one. And then we'll come back around to you in the question period. And uh, we'll be taking a break uh, roughly an hour in for about 10 minutes. So uh, just to give us a modicum of sanity with all of our um, immense amounts of screen time that we all have. So before introducing Gargi, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction that is intending to give a sense of some of the research that's uh, happening in and around the Department of Visual Cultures on critical finance. And I'm also at the end of, uh, after Garvey's talk, um, I have invited two of my wonderful colleagues to open up the Q&A period as respondents to Gargi. And that is because uh, I'm really interested in the ways in which Gargi's research intersects with all kinds of different research streams. And so I was especially interested in inviting Jana and Danvir as respondents because they would be able to pick up threads in Gargi's work that is um, very different perhaps from how um, I'm going to frame certain aspects of uh, the debates and conversation in my introduction. So I'm really thinking in this session of modeling something like um, my experience of research in this department, which is not so much that I'm part of some kind of uh, a cluster that is stable and, um, and consistent, but more that there are all these different threads of research and conversations and events unfolding. And so I wanted to try to stage a dialogue between different uh, kinds of research uh, in this session. So Jana Brown is a lecturer in visual cultures in the Department of Goldsmiths. Uh, she'll be a respondent after Gargi speaks. Um, and her research interrogates how art, radical education and research methodologies are mobilized to respond to contemporary social urgencies, including the struggles around race uh, migration, gentrification and anti-racism. There are many things to say uh, about Jana's research, uh, but in particular, uh, uh, in this context, she has recently co-authored a book with uh, Gargi Bhattacharya and others, How Media and Conflicts Make Migrants, that looks at uh, migration in the UK and problems of uh, racism that emerge around it. Uh, Dan Veer Brar is a lecturer in visual cultures in the Department of Visual Cultures at Goldsmiths, and he'll also be a respondent to Gargi's talk today. Um, and he is a scholar and writer who works across the fields of Black studies, cultural studies, and critical theory. Um, and very much uh, of relevance and note, 
for the purposes of this session is that Dan Veer, along with uh, our colleague Louis Marino, um, gave this really wonderful Visual Cultures Public Program series back in autumn 2018 called Bleeding Edges and Solvent Objects, Racial Capitalism and Urban Technopoetics. This was uh, quite an amazing lecture series. Uh, I certainly learned a lot from it. And I really wanted to bring in uh, Dan Veer so that he could perhaps carry forward some of those conversations that happened around the 2018 Autumn uh, Visual Cultures Lecture Series, uh, since it was such a rich uh, vein of investigation. So um, before I introduce Gargi, I'll give a little bit of context and background uh, to explain why I was um, really wanting to bring her in. So I invited Gargi to speak when I was organizing the 12th Annual Critical Finance Studies Conference, uh, which we hosted at Goldsmiths in 2020. Um, and I should say before I show more slides that I'm going to show a lot of books and some journals in this session. At the end, in the q and I will pop all of the names of the books and uh, journals into the chat, just in case there's someone who might be interested in these, but um, not able to write them down <laughs> um, as I flip through the slides quite quickly. Um, so in the Critical Finance Studies Conference that we hosted this summer, we had a range of thinkers who are uh, thinking quite critically about the role of finance in society more broadly and using a transdisciplinary perspective in a variety of ways to think about how finance directly and indirectly impacts many aspects of life, um, both within the financial uh, sectors and financial world and perhaps even more interestingly, very far beyond those. So we had people like uh, Katerina Pistor, whose book, The Code of Capital, is doing some really um, incredible work on uh, what's known as the legal theory of finance. So thinking about the ways in which, in order to create wealth inequality, finance must be inaugurated into law, and therefore a, a, an approach to finance that um, draws attention to law and its role in coding capital is very important. We also invited Annie McClanahan, whose book Dead Pledges from 2016 was a really vibrant study of um, 21st century culture and representations of debt and crisis, particularly in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And certainly in this moment of uh, financial crisis, there is uh, much to say about an analysis of visual culture and culture more broadly that draws attention to the dynamics of finance and financialization. And Garvey Bhattacharya was speaking at an opening panel at Critical Finance this summer on um, pandemic as financial crisis. And so we were thinking about the current moment and what happens when a pandemic becomes a, not only a health crisis, but also something that, that is um, sort of perpetrating all kinds of other, um, or even catalyzing other kinds of oppressions because and, and through the ways in which it is translated into a financial crisis um, as, as well as being a health crisis. And so we were thinking about how the rather oblique relationships between financial markets plunging and uh, you know, many other phenomena that, uh, that many of us have sadly experienced in the last several months, uh, looming mass redundancies, stretched social welfare systems, employment volatility, threats to housing security, sectoral collapse, and exacerbated racial, gender, and class inequalities, which are but a few of the signs of financial failure in the wake of the coronavirus. And of course, this is happening well all the while. Uh, governments such as the British government have been accused of using the pandemic as a smokescreen, invoking exceptional powers to allow cronyism and rentierism to flourish. So for all of these reasons, it seems so very urgent to think about finance and financialization in a transdisciplinary way, and in particular to think about the indirect ways in which finance and financialization impact so many aspects of our lives, our social relations, our cultural uh, activities, etc. And it seems that 
um, interest in critical finance is um, very much at a high at the moment, uh, perhaps not surprisingly given the urgency of the, um, the facility with which many societal problems seem to become translated into the terms of finance. And there are many recent books and uh, journals that draw our attention to these mechanisms and the debates that surround them. Um, I'm thinking of Christian Borsch and Robert Wozniczer's recent The Rutledge uh, Handbook of Critical Finance Studies, uh, which is, I think, just come out or maybe just about to come out. Uh, this is drawing on, uh, among other things, the very influential work of Randy Martin, um, and from financialization of daily life in 2002 to his last book, Knowledge Limited Toward a Social Logic of the Derivative, which invites us to think about how finance restructures social relations far beyond markets themselves. Um, and they're also working um, in the people like uh, the anthropologist Arjun Apadurai, um, who wrote this book, Banking on Words, The Failure of Language in the Age of Derivative Finance, um, five years ago. And also, we think here about the, um, the emergence of new journals that, like finance and society and valuation studies, that are trying to uh, think about finance and value in a transdisciplinary way to stage complex encounters between financial ideas of what value might be and other forms of value, um, other things more broadly that we might value um, as, as people, as, uh, as society. Um, and indeed, there is also this um, very recently published Rutledge International Handbook of Financialization, uh, which came out earlier this year, which encapsulates encapsulate some of the debates around the term financialization. Uh, the uh, definition of financialization is um, certainly widely contested and by no means uh, agreed upon by scholars. There are strains of financialization theory that draw attention to shifts in the corporation and its structures and the increasing importance of shareholder value. There are other threads that look at regimes of accumulation and financialization. So looking at the invention of financial derivatives and complex financial products that allow for investment to come at a, res uh, at a remove from commodities. So without underlying um, assets necessarily needing to change hands. And the editors of this volume are very clear that they are a little bit concerned with the over reach of the term financialization, so a certain tendency, and I'd have to say I'm guilty of it myself, um, of saying, you know, X has been financialized, everything in the world is financialized, social life is financialized. Now, in some ways that might be true, but these authors draw attention to the needs to be um, very careful with the limits of what financialization actually is as well. And to think about where financialization ends, that a good theory of financialization, whatever it might be, should be specific to specific mechanisms through which various kinds of value are captured and perhaps reframed uh, according to the terms of financial valuation. Equally, there are books like this, uh, Keen Birch and Fabian Munesa's Assetization, uh, which are kind of questioning the predominance of the term financialization uh, itself in many of the debates that are trying to uh, counter and be critical of uh, the oversized role that finance plays in, uh, in daily life. Um, and instead, they're drawing attention to processes by which things become assets. Uh, and indeed, personalities and reputations can become assets as well as various kinds of objects. Uh, and recently, Brett Christophers um, is uh, just about to come out with this book um, with Verso on rentier capitalism. And he's argued that um, even though uh, the United Kingdom, for example, might be indeed a very financialized economy, i.e. it has a really outsized financial sector um, and things like real estate prices uh, play a rather outsized role in uh, creating oppression in, uh, across the country. Um, we might actually think of finance, uh, finance and finance, financialization as only one aspect of what he terms a rentier economy, a form of rentier capitalism. And he draws attention to the, the recent PPE debacle, I'm sure you might have seen, um, 
in which the government gave a supremely cronyistic deal for personal uh, protective equipment to a company that had a direct link to, uh, to government. And he said that this is uh, this kind of debacle is shows the fundamentally kind of rentierist orientations of the UK. Um, that that rentierism and rentier capitalism is fundamentally oriented to having rather than doing, and it's based on a proprietorial rather than an entrepreneurial ethos. I think this is very significant, given that so many theories of the neoliberal subject are based on an idea of entrepreneurialism inherited more or less uh, through Foucault's uh, lectures on uh, the birth of biopolitics and neoliberalism at the Collège de France in 1979. Um, so where does that leave us uh, with this current moment? Uh, well, um, the pandemic obviously is a moment in which a health crisis has it, uh, unleashed huge volatility uh, across markets and it's increased uh, the, the scope and reach of volatility. Um, volatility is, we could say, incredibly important to financial value. Um, as Benjamin Lee writes in the introduction of derivatives and the wealth of societies, uh, quote, volatility is the randomness in things that is felt as the intensity of change. In finance, this instantaneous or actual volatility is transformed into a historically based statistical measure. This standard deviation of price movements over some fixed time frame. Um, and so derivative finance, um, which uh, as it took off in, in the 70s, was fundamentally based around the discovery and pricing of volatility. The fact that volatility, the, the uh, waxing and waning of values over time could be plotted, could be statistically measured. And then the measure of that volatility could become a source of value itself. Um, equally, I couldn't resist <laughs> this um, headline in the Financial Times from August 2020, which shows uh, turbulent markets upending volatility hedge funds. So even volatility hedge funds, hedge funds which are financial products that are designed uh, to mitigate risk and to increase portfolio uh, success and, um, and diversification. Uh, even the uh, hedge funds that were trying to capitalize on volatility in particular <laughs> managed to fail. Uh, amongst so many other things that have failed financially uh, this year because they were banking on a relatively stable economy. Um, and Benjamin Lee invites uh, in his introduction to derivatives and the wealth of society more, more consideration on volatility, not only the fact that volatility as something that is felt, that is immediate, a kind of felt changeability, um, but it's also measurable and therefore different from uncertainty, which is also very much in the mix at the moment. Um, but he invites us to uh, think about volatility in a, a much broader way than it tends to be thought about in finance. So he writes, financial work on volatility tends to focus on its mathematical aspects, eschewing the social and cultural dimensions of volatility that trading and market activity presuppose. And this is very much a prompt that I am interested in taking up both in my own research and in this event. So how can we think about volatility as something that produces uh, knock-on effects all over the place that might have a direct relationship to financial mechanisms of oppression, but equally, which might have very indirect and uh, difficult to ascertain relationships to financial markets as such. Um, and this is where I think Gargi Bhattacharya's work is uh, so interesting. Um, and her book, Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Questions of Reproduction, and survival is, I think, such a beautifully written and uh, sensitive and very careful um, document uh, of the try a kind of tracing of the ways in which um, capitalism treats everyone so differently. The the ways in which the experience of capitalism is. Uh, in, inevitably intertwined with race um, and very much, of course, drawing from uh, Cedric Robinson's um, massively uh, important black Marxism, uh, which, of course, uh, Danvier and Lewis uh, touched on quite a lot in their lecture series from two years ago. And so Gargi, um, in the opening of this book, invites us to think about 
uh, racial capitalism in terms of a house where uh, a sprawling house where everyone is in different rooms and maybe uh, has a totally different experience in, in their specific room. And there's some kind of a myth that one day everyone will get into the living room. And yet, no one, not everyone will get into the living room. And that is fundamental to how capitalism works, that it must uh, treat different subjects so differently. And so um, I um, was really interested in bringing Gargi uh, back after her amazing talk at Critical Finance around um, where she spoke uh, really eloquently around what happens to race in the United Kingdom uh, in a moment of governance by neglect, in a moment when there is great financial stability and also uh, great neglect uh, from the government in protecting people. Uh, and th this, this sort of um, sets off race uh, relations in, in a variety of complicated uh, ways. And so now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Gargi Bhattacharya and to, um, to turn the floor over to her. Um, Gargi has published very widely on the um, topics of race and racism, sexualities, global culture, the war on terror, and increasingly austerity and racial capitalism. Her recent books uh, are not only uh, Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Questions of Reproduction and Survival, um, which is uh, clearly hugely significant for uh, today's talk, um, but also uh, we have Austerity in Everyday Life, Living in a Time of Diminishing Expectations, um, How Media and Conflicts Make uh, Migrants with uh, Kristen uh, Forkert, Federico Oliveri and Jana Graham, and Race and Power, Global Racism in the 21st Century. Um, so on that note, I'm going to um, just change over to uh, Gargi's slides and turn the floor over to Gargi. So huge and very warm welcome to Gargi. Mm. That's good, but I can't, oh right, yes, that's ah. me. <laughs> and as always, I've done the wrong exam because I thought this wasn't still your finance group. So I'm not talking about finance at all. But I think some of what you're talking about in terms of um, unstable landscapes might make sense. And if you were at the event in August, I do apologise because really this feels like just an expansion of that much shorter talk. Um, but hopefully it will raise some questions that we might be able to have a bit of chat around. I'm really not going to try and talk for ages but do kick me if I'm going on for too long, because, you know, who needs this kind of going on all the time? Oh, so can I move it? No, only you have to move it. Oh, this is a trick, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I think um, so. I am going to um, go forward on your slide. So I've now gone to the second. OK, lovely. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to put my <laughs> thumbs up when it's time to just move forward then so that we have a system. Great. All right. Volatility. It's so hard at the moment to hear words like that and to stay kind of level headed, isn't it? Dangerous times, such very dangerous times. Times when the ground shifts under your feet and your surroundings speed up or slow down or melt away so that nothing and no one can hold you anymore. And of course, all of those stories we've heard so often, haven't we? All that is solid. And of course, of course, there is nothing new in the world of social analysis, even as you think you live in a moment unlike any other. The books of your youth come back to haunt you. The horrors of other moments echo in ours. And yet, despite knowing all of this, doesn't it feel like we're living through something quite unlike what any of us and perhaps what anyone has experienced before? So I think that's the first moment about... This is some crazy shit we're living through, isn't it? And maybe for us, not the very worst of it. Um, so it is kind of important, I think, for us, given the habits of scholarly types, to quite understandably revisit the analytic accounts of other moments, to say the things that feel the same, that instability, that lack of ground to stand on, that rapid kind of fragmentation of institutional bases just in front of your eyes, 
that despite the seeming familiarity of all of that, there is something that is a little bit unlike any other, most other moments that I've ever seen documented. That although we're seeing a kind of destabilisation of our everyday lives, it isn't really or not only an innovation from the right. Um, I've been writing a, a short project with some other people and we keep and we were talking about before COVID the kind of moment of planned disruption, that kind of Dominic Cummings moment, the idea, oh yes, disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. And we had a whole kind of account of what was likely to happen after the 2019 election, how quickly a kind of reshuffling of the cabinet brought in these international players. Rishi Sunak, for all of white people's strange interest in his sticky out ears, is mainly important to know as the partner of the heiress of the largest IT firm in India, so a kind of global financial player. Not, you know, his own trading background is small potatoes compared to his married inness to that new kind of global. You know, if there's a financial aristocracy, he is part of it and it's a global alliance. So that all of that refiguring was happening. And and they were telling us it's to disrupt. Of course, COVID changes that. Whatever their plan was, what we're living through is not quite Thatcherism rebooted because the um, ideological project, although there's, you know, of course it remains, it is not being run in the way that was planned. Of course, some of that might still come. January looms. Never underestimate the ability of the right to make a shit situation even worse. You know, I'm not saying, oh, look, it can't get worse. But the kind of disruption we've been living through is a different kind of disruption, much more kind of unsettling. This particular whirlwind of horror where environment and body and very long embedded hardships come together to make this new landscape to die in. And I think... That's kind of the interesting thing, isn't it? That biting back of the body and um, the variable vulnerability of different bodies alongside this, this other infra infrastructure of inequality that we're too accustomed to living with. That's what's terrible, terrifying, unpredictable, volatile about our moment. Both the um, orchestrated disruption of the right for all of the reasons the right always wants to disrupt and on top of that, something which may be occasioned by the same actions of the right, but is not orchestrated in the same way, which is beyond strict orchestration. It's open to be um, you know, made made money from, but that's different from orchestration. So like kind of I just kind of feel we need to say that to each other. Because also when things are very, very bad, it's so it's kind of reassuring to say oh, our old enemies are doing it to us again. But that may not be the best or the most helpful way for us to speak to each other. Oh, sorry, I can't do my own slides, so thank you. And inevitably, some silly things are being said because we're only human after all. Now, that's kind of what I mean, that the will to try and understand things that are shifting very, very quickly in front of our eyes and shifting in ways that, just eroding our livelihoods you know, overnight. You now, this is, you know, people have probably heard that um, for some time now, people who live in Britain but who've lived in other places who where there's been a real serious economic meltdown or an internal civil war, talk about the ways in which Britain has felt like that for a while, that since um, the referendum, there's a kind of unravelling of, of what is happening. And it's not an absolute unravelling. It's not like you wake up in the morning and the bombs have dropped. You don't know that it's unravelling. And yet the institutional practices, the anchorings of um, infrastructure, the ways in which even in small ways, formal processes can be made even slightly accountable, even if we think democracy is a bit of a fiction. But, you know, the slight accountabilities, that those erosions that have been happening now bring us to this point. Oh, things are really bleh. You know, very difficult to pitch. I understand why people feel that, oh, COVID seems like just a continuation of that. But maybe we need to pause a bit when we think about pandemic and that 
you know, I must get, you know, this, I'm, this is a version of this, it, isn't it? Saying too much too soon. But all of that writing like this that people have been doing this year, I wonder what that's going to look like in a few, in even just a few years. That in the midst of the first months of pandemic, everyone wrote like this, and all those books come out. Anyway, but, you know, we're only human. And that moment of trying to document as you live through it, that's part of it. But maybe it's not the only part. So that for all of our sakes, we need to also pace ourselves and say, well, we'll review that moment of trying to understand as we stood on the shaky ground. OK, sorry, next one. <clears throat> so more what I've been trying to think is really how very hard it is to think at all. Um, equally, I have colleagues and friends, people I write with who are saying, you know, how can you think at all now? Like how, how insensitive to try and make sense of this carnage? And especially a little bit earlier on when people are still so so alone, really, that one of the ways of um, that I think COVID has impacted on us is to make us be very, very alone. You know, you know, it is the techniques of containment are actively about splitting us from each other. So there's something about how very hard it is to think at all that I really wanted to just have a chance to say to different people. And that um, whether there is something alongside or just kind of not quite within the academic industry machine that says maybe not everything is an opportunity, that not every bad time is a new book series, not every thing horror that we need to live through is a new subset of the literature. So I'm really trying, although I'm not sure this piece really does it, but I'll try again next time to think, well, look, what would thinking be for at a time when we're not sure which of us will live or die? So perhaps the questions may be only the questions that make sense for solace, for survival and for liberation. And all of the other questions could just be paused temporarily for now. Solace because we need to make it. Survival, because the question of survival is has become central to the place we're in. And I mean in quite practical ways, you know, not only in terms of rights, but what would um, the reorientation of knowledge for practical survival look like for us? And alongside that, what does liberation mean? So that's and I've been writing a few little bits and bobs about, OK, what what are the things that are even worth thinking about now? Thank you. OK, some of these slides, you know, I've been trying to learn not to have so many words on my slides, but it means there's almost no words. You know, you read all these um, trainings we're meant to be doing about oh, everything's online, everyone looks on screen every time. One of the big lessons that I never do if I'm in person is, oh, don't have many words on a slide. But then you have like 50 slides or with three words on each. But this one makes me laugh. This is um, if I was doing a show, this is the divertiment but a kind of little bit when I kind of say aha I look to screen and I'm going to tell you my little cameo so it's a main story but there's a side story about being typecast subtitled what will I do when people lose interest in racial capitalism and not just me but you know I care about me Thanks, so. <laughs> so I already feel like, oh, no, not capitalism again. I never thought I'd feel like that. That's terrible, isn't it? Like your favourite ice cream flavour. And I think, oh, no, don't get at me again. There's something odd about academic fashions and about how analytic ter terms kind of come to ascendance, I think, and how quickly it can be. So you can be on the outside thinking, oh, no one's listening to me. There's only me and my two mates talking about this. And then it feels like, oh, no, some more people are listening. And then it's almost over. And it's like you're the only person wearing flares anymore. I think racial capitalism in, is in that kind of dangerous moment. Because the ways in which um, academic fashion, as I've said here, can empty out what is beautiful and insightful about a concept until the repetition numbs people's ability to think altogether. I've been trying to think about that. What does that do to a set of debates which so much are grounded in a street politics, as grounded in a street politics as they are grounded in 
and, and academic debate, have come to popularity because of movements that have happened in the street politics, not particularly because of movements in the academy, but because of that, suddenly, you know, you could go to a panel in any department in almost any university in the Western Hemisphere or Northern Hemisphere, wherever we're, you know, North and West, and that someone could be giving a paper this A, B, C and D and racial capitalism. Mm. What kind of mix is that? I had another point, which I'm not going to say really, but I also wonder if it's about a certain particular moment of crisis in the university as we know it, that about kind of loss of the ability to think about how we might learn through the institutional space of the university. But that's that's a different story for a different miserable day. More immediately, there's something about, ah, oh, what are we supposed to do when we think about racial capitalism for good political reasons? Yeah, you know, that's my background. I still think that would be one of the things that if you wanted to have a serious talk with people that you wanted to do things with, this would be part of how you'd want to plot the landscape because it changes how you think about where the enemies are, what, where we are positioned um, to each other and what working in concert or in parallel might look like. You know, these are all core questions for mobilization. They're not, you know, they're not only questions about is this a good depiction of the world? They're questions about what are we able to do together? Back to solace, survival and liberation. That if you can't grasp those things, you might get a bit of solace, but survival and liberation are going to be in tight demand. You know, you're not going to get there. But once terms get kind of emptied of meaning because of certain kinds of, I don't know, is it overuse? You know, that everyone thinks for a moment, that is such an apt phrase, let me use it again and again. So you can't hear it anymore. So what was what was surprising even, you know, because people didn't remember Cedric Robinson. Certainly in this country, when Cedric Robinson died, I didn't notice really any kind of marking of that, which is only a few years ago. But now, racial capitalism feels such like a commonsensical term of the left that it, um, the kind of slight jolt it used to have when people heard that phrase, which helped people think that that seems to have gone. All I'm really kind of saying there is that um, any great tune that we make up, we need to keep moving on because. Um, and I've also, you know, and I've, I've also seen good friends and colleagues really die on, die in a ditch to defend a certain analytic language without really recognising how quickly those analytic languages become institutionalised. I'd argue that intersectionality has become that kind of language, despite a very illustrious and um, politically grounded history. It doesn't altogether belong to liberation anymore because of, you know, doesn't mean you don't use it, but you kind of you need to think then about how you use those words. Anyway, on to the next one, please. Right, so in my cameo about what I think might need saying about racial capitalism, given that we're in both this most scary and volatile of moments with a volatility that is beyond economic disruption to other kinds of physiological disruption that could not easily be planned for by left or right or anyone. What is what are the kind of warnings we might say to each other about how we think about racial capitalism? You know, what, you know, what work is it doing then? So I just had a couple of things to kind of say because of how I think the phrase is turning around public space. So I think at its very, very worst, you know, in the kind of the most miserable of incarnations, you can see a kind of misuse of the term racial capitalism that implies that nothing at all can be done. We're too divided. Racism is too entrenched. The history of capitalism, of course, reveals the same dehumanization and dis dehumanization and dispossession again and again. And that means that those attempts to overcome certain kinds of division are destined to fail inevitably and always for an, a certain kind of structural account. And although it's a bit of a bad tempered thing to say, I think those kinds of arguments, whatever they think they're doing, are ways of using the arguments of racial capitalism for conservative ends. 
because there's nothing in this telling that can undo the centuries of violence that divide us. And that's it. and I'm surprised at how quickly that kind of account and use of the language of racial capitalism has become popularised and, and repeated in different settings, both political and um, scholarly settings. Whatever other differences people may have with core scholars of racial capitalism, I really think that if people hear it as a way of saying nothing can be done, rather than what what else is to be done, there's something lacking in the reading. And I have to say, I have, have to think it's a kind of willful lack in the reading. Hopefully that's something some of you might want to talk about. <clears throat> so much better, of course, because I like to think, you know, if if what I'm doing might not have some impact on thinking for solace, thinking for survival and thinking for liberation. Why bother doing it? Because it's hard enough to just stay alive right now. Much better, I think, to think of the question of racial capitalism. And I always try and say, look, it's like a question. It's like a question of saying, well, if we think is like this and will almost, despite itself, lead to a logic in which we become interchangeable and homogenous and so that there is one unified class subject who emerges regardless of location and politics. What about the ways in which we are made divided and different? You know, that's that's the question of racial capitalism. It's not a question which says, yay, black capitalism. It's not a question which says we are um, nature makes us different. I think it's a question which says, if we think capitalism has the seed of it of a better future in its own own horror, what about this? What can we do with this? How do we navigate this? How do we process our knowledge of this, which is the ways in which we are kept in the different segmented segmented landscapes of capitalism? So I think first, much better, much more apt, much more sustaining, because solace is also about forms of knowledge which make you feel that there will be something to be done, even if I'm not sure what that thing is quite now. To think of the discourse of racial capitalism as a better way to understand the workings of racism. So much better, I think, than the various liberal accounts of interpersonal antagonism, unconscious bias, lack of awareness, and all the ways in which even some of our accounts of institutional racism still come back to an idea of racism as that kind of intergroup tension. Racial capitalism gives us a whole language and analytic framework to say, is that really what we mean by racism? Someone didn't quite like me? People dying left, right and centre quickly and slowly, people subject to violence, people's lives never making the sense that they should do, people knowing that they will be hungry at night and no one will fix it. But we're going to say our oh, racism is some people don't like some of the groups of people. That's a trick. And the discourse of racial capitalism helps you think around that trick to a different way of thinking about not that there is no racism, which is like some bad bits of the left also say that. There's no racism, that's just a fiction that capitalism has put in our heads. But saying, yeah, there is a racism, but maybe it works quite differently to that. And therefore, maybe what we need to do about it is something quite unlike the different institutional routes that we're being offered. So that's one thing. And that does give me a bit of solace, actually. And I think it might even one day lead to some liberation. Again, maybe not for me, but for maybe for some people in the room who are younger than me. But it's also a corrective, isn't it? The discourse of racial capitalism is a corrective, not a corrective to say give up on liberation, but a corrective that says those kinds of Marxisms of the global north that are too flattening, too prematurely celebratory about what class unity might be about. Calm down a bit calm down a bit and be real with those who are the ones who are on your side because what, what is the benefit of pretending something is there that is not there better to think of the quite difficult questions of racial capitalism because you know that's not that's not an immediate program 
but at least it's the apt question. And again, I think, has more hope of solace, survival and liberation than the fantastical accounts of an always already unified working class, as if class unity happens without location, without politics, without mobilisation, without organisation, because it just is. Well, you know, I know people like to pray, but that kind of prayer has not been saving any lives yet. So we need to speak to each other in a way that our mutual survival might be on the table at least. OK. On to the next one, please. I'll try and hurry up. I've been speaking for ages. God. So. Racial capitalism, of course, is a lens to understand dynamic situations. Seems a foolish thing to have to say, but sadly still worth saying. The point is not to say that there is some timeless truth about how we are with each other in economic space. And that once you've said, aha, it's not capitalism, it's racial capitalism, you win. The prize is not recognition. The prize is not to say, oh, you used to have an unraced account of capitalism, but I made you say race. What kind of thing is that? The only point ever is to get free. I'm sorry to always say this, um, this most predictable thing, but perhaps part of our solace and mutual survival is being able to say to each other, that's the only game in town. All of the others are just noise. Right, now a bit on state neglect, and I'm going to really try and speed up because I think I've already been talking for 25 minutes, which is far too long. Right, try and speed up a bit, Gargi, try and be done by six. Right, the landscape made left by state neglect. This is a longer kind of set of work that I've been doing, but and I apologise if some of you have heard me say it before, but just so you hear the bits of the story. Austerity, which feels like a tea party from some time ago now, but we should remember as a very active project of state violence that killed plenty of people quickly and slowly by neglect and by making their lives unlivable and all of these things. What austerity does, it entrenches racialized and others, other divisions. It expels some, especially some of those who might have had the most tenuous footing in the formal economy into this hinterland of precarity without end. It's worth remembering how recently that whole set of moves has been, because now that's business as usual, isn't it? Within, oh, I see, that wasn't quick enough. Um, but that, the last 10, 12, 15 years, you know, because some of it's, um, ha there's a process happening before 2008, but that's all because, come suddenly people just get pushed out of the formal economy the formal economy will seem like a smaller and smaller thing even the formal economy there is will be less and less meaningfully regulated there'll be all of this other stuff where we're not quite sure what's happening i've said in other places the only thing that i account that i can kind of point to that makes it seem similar and i don't mean to trivialize it because i don't work on zones of conflict but it sound feels like some elements of how people describe war economies, that there are large amounts of people whose economic practice is so far outside what the economy proper is supposed to be doing and, and can see and can be measured and can be regulated, that it's like there's a whole other, a whole other world of economy of survival that is happening and that more and more people are getting pushed into it. And there's a whole other group of people who are kind of always straddling it and they get a little bit of formal work and then they get pushed back into precarity again and they're in and out. That's our normality now, sadly, isn't it? Even for some quite middle class people. And if you live in a city like London, we live almost without noticing the landscape that that kind of economy makes. Alongside that, the state exits many aspects of everyday life and lots of quite recently established expectations around welfare, social support, a safety net, just all get pulled away like this quickly, quickly, leaving little more than the punitive functions of the state. And very, very importantly, what remains of the welfare-like provisions of the state are reframed as punitive encounters. And I'm going to say a bit more on the next slide about that, I hope.
Okay, right, good, thanks. Um, how this has happened has been really, I've previously described also as a kind of reworking of the techniques of distribution so that no one is entitled to anything as of right. Instead, every encounter with the state requires a kind of evidencing, some kind of credentialism or other, so that if you have any encounter with the state for anything you need, you are performing in a way and, and documenting and showing, and that you might be turned down at any moment, even if you get through the first hurdles, there's always the next one. You're never established in your rights, that, that the um, process of showing yourself to be somewhat entitled is never over, that you have to keep performing it. And that's written in, that, you, know, you don't need me to, that, that's explicitly in the technique and is based around the idea that people cheat, people's circumstances change, you can't trust them. If you don't keep them jumping, they'll become dependent. You know, that it's all in the machinery. You, know, you didn't have to be an academic to say, oh, they're doing that. They told us they were doing that. And now that has become business as usual. The only business of usual in state functioning in terms of direct contact with the population that, that is around. That has some problems for us in the times of COVID. Part of that disciplining it into a version of compliance is um, this always passing through into the next stage of surveillance. The story I always used to say as a way of understanding it, which works best for people who've had children recently or know of people who've had children recently, are the ways in which you're invited into systems of surveillance, highly punitive surveillance, which you might be able to um, pass through but are very difficult to refuse and the one that um that you know works emotionally for me is if you have a baby in this country and you want your baby to have those first jabs and be weighed and things you have to fill out this whole form that whole form firstly that's the kind of beginning of your baby's credentialist trail what are you allowed or not allowed they ask you explicitly issues around your immigration status you can just about, or you could when I last had a kid, refuse the immigration status of the father. I just had to do it by saying I'm not going to name the father at all. But to not name the immigration status of the mother stops you getting to the next room where your baby is weighed and given the vitamin drops and such things. I don't believe in everyday bordering. In lots of us other spaces of my life, I might be able to disrupt it. But the way in which that machinery of credentialism works for my infant seems to me still almost impossible to resist. So that doesn't require me to consent. It just requires me to be so needy of that particular service in the moment when the documenting is happening that I have almost no option but to perform that thing and that there are different parallels of those kinds of process happening through um, distribution for austerity. And if you fail them, if you fail any of these compliance tests, then the punitive arm of the state can come, even if you were not doing something wrong. So I'm thinking about things like um, being on housing lists, you know, that if you're on a housing list for a long time and then you get into some completely inadequate place, um, the local authority will say, you know, you're no longer either you've made yourself intentionally homeless because you moved into an inadequate place or you're no longer on the list at all. Benefit sanctions are like that. But if you miss different bits, I have used to have a whole load of material about all the ways in which people were sanctioned around benefits. That's about saying if you want to claim something, you have to risk the fact that will make your life worse. So that even the act of claiming entitlement has the risk of active punishment. And things like, you know, medical care and school allocations have similar kinds of tripwires within them now. But if you get a bit wrong, you can expel yourself or your child or your loved one from the system. You can carry this kind of um, punishment. So I said I'll speed up and now I haven't speeded up at all. <clears throat> right. OK, now we're on to where we are now, because that's slightly that's the last decades bad news isn't it austerity now in some new horror where we all have to actually be nostalgic for austerity is not quite as bad as this what we see now is of quite another order and i'm not sure if it's really governance at all one of the things that i'd, I'd argued about austerity is that austerity functioned in a way 
that actively um, actively inculcated despair amongst the population in order to say we don't even need hegemony anymore because we don't need your consent we can make you do this whether you like it or not yeah maybe we used to try and get your hearts and minds but who cares now we just want your compliance and your belief that there is nothing you can do about it because that erosion of the uh, um the public space of political life that hey that works for us we're seeing a different order of that, that kind of trend now. It's barely hegemonic and barely trying to be so, you know, almost laughable non-performance. There's a very open transfer of state resources to private crony hands that we've already heard about and people couldn't live in this country now and not see it's kind of, you're not even bothering to hide it from us because what's going to happen, what, you know, you're going to get one of those BBC journalists and not ask you a question in, you know, what is the mechanism? There's no mechanism. Everybody knows the fact that we know doesn't matter. Abandoning pretty much all previous conventions of performing competence very quickly. Poor old Theresa May. Who would have thought I'd ever feel sorry for Theresa May? Theresa May stands up in Parliament this week and she's almost kind of saying, look, you're not even playing by the most minimal rules of political performance. What is this? But that not needed anymore. And that was already in the Disruptor Boys plan before COVID. That if you knock enough things away quickly enough, you don't even have to play by the rules because we make the landscape. And sadly, I hope some people are going to say better things than what I say after this. I think it's pretty effective. I think it really intensifies the sense of helplessness and hopelessness amongst the population that is already legitimately scared by pandemic. That that non-performance of authority or that open performance of cronyism is a really very effective post-hegemonic strategy in terms of quietening down any possibility of anything else. Right now in Britain, at the fourth quarter of 2020 that feels like that's really doing the work well um so in terms of the landscape of neglect what does pandemic do and of course this is another thing you don't you don't need me to tell you this anyone could tell you this go to any bus stop in the country and they'll say yeah what pandemic has done has intensified and exacerbated pre-existing inequalities that those systems which in previous pre-authority systems which implied even where they didn't quite deliver automatic entitlement that, that their dismantlement has already led to this intensively differentiated population so you know the small kind of correctives of our differentiation that even an imperfect welfareism used to do that's been out the window for a while and we know perfectly well health vulnerability inhabits these pre-existing landscapes of inequality. <clears throat> so there's something about pandemic that really has amplified and made visible those sedimented inequalities, that longer history of what puts some people in different places, makes their bodies weaker, makes their access to resources different. And you kind of see this terrible horror show of what racial capitalism means enacted through pandem pandemic. And we all know it. You know, again, there's been this thing out, I don't know if it's out today or out yesterday, about even the Tory government. You know, me and my partner are laughing that the Tory spokesperson, the former special advisor, is saying, well, it's not just race, it's race and class. Yeah, tell me about it. You know, like, oh, well, that's your response. It's not racism because it's race and class. That's our line. <laughs> now the thing that I've had started to talk about in the summer and I haven't got much further in it because I've been trying to fight for jobs all every waking minute and sleeping minute is that on this landscape made by the, neg the willful neglect of austerity and the remaking of statecraft to make everyone disentitled Pandemic enters and it means that we have no kind of infrastructure in which to think about safety. And one way I think of thinking about what's happening is this outsourcing of the assessment of risk. 
and outsourcing to all of us in all of our everyday lives. And, what, and I think this is a very particular and very scary, dangerous moment that somehow combines authoritarianism and neglect, things which wouldn't normally be so overtly linked in this, even in the, in the rhetoric, when the stories don't work so well in that way. <clears throat> um, I'm talking, you know, honey, you can't come in here now. <laughs> Sorry, someone came to see, oh, are you not finished yet? God, when will this end? It's my kid. Um, and alongside that kind of bringing together of authoritarianism and neglect, so both the state says, I can kick you and I can let you die. They're the two things I can do. When you look at each other, you should think that the only things that any other per, you know, human creature deserves are a kicking or a being left to die. That's, that's the non-debate about free school meals over the holidays, isn't it? That, um, OK, well, it's not our job to feed people. We can only take our hands off because otherwise where will the responsibility to see how quickly people will die or not? You know, that's overtly it. How how hungry can small children be? That kind of plays on this slightly longer history in which populations have been coerced into anti-solidarity. Partly the ways that I'm saying that credentialism, even if it doesn't need my heart and mind, it's a kind of coercion into anti-solidarity because the disallowing of small gestures of solidarity or the disallowing of ethical choice in credentialism, which I know harms others. Um, and also the threat of criminalization if you do not um, clearly participate in some kinds of active anti-solidarity in the eyes of the state, because the state is saying, if you don't want a kicking, you need to tell me who else needs a kicking. Um, that, I think, creates a whole set of subjects who might be particularly vulnerable to this combined core of authoritarianism and neglect. <clears throat> and it means that um, we're left without much more than these varieties of amateur risk assessment. Um, you can see that in the variation in public attitudes and adherence to public health guidance. I think if I speed up to the end, then we could have a break. What do you think? You just try and run through them. So I think there's only about three more. So visualising risk when there's no one to take care of you. What's happening, I think, is that we're all trying to learn on the hoof a kind of um, version of amateur risk assessment. And, and that's partly because this experience of systematic state neglect forces us all back on a kind of best guessing. That's within the kind of logics of neglect. It means that we're living with new kind of, I'm calling them aesthetics, but that's not quite the right word, but new kind of readings of appearance and physicality of safety and risk. Worn very variably, read even more variably. We're all choosing to present as adherent or not, risky or not, frightened or not. And our interactions with each other are reshaped through these performances. And, and, you, and I think all of us are kind of varying through those performances in all kinds of different spaces, because what kind of subject are we supposed to be to each other? But at the same time, as the, you know, those kind of innovations around how you meant to be, be a thing with others in the time of pandemic, those old mythologies of race and class and contamination reappear. And they partly reappear as a response to the doubtfulness of official accounts. So when people think, well, that Johnson's a right old liar and he's an incompetent and I don't trust the state and the state can't do anything for me, into that kind of absence old and dangerous myths about absolute racial difference of degenerate class um, groupings about contamination across boundaries or seeping. And, it, and I think we're kind of living through these competing assessments of risk. We're living through battles which are not altogether decided, but right now don't feel that hopeful about comp competing techniques of risk evaluation. And again, yeah, don't need me to tell you this. You can just watch telly any day and you can hear people say them. All these varieties of what would it be to be a kind of knowing and risk managing subject right now. Varieties of highly interpreted scientific guidance. Who would have thought it? Then, yeah, 
can stop in any place and have any kind of human interaction with someone. And people have all got this kind of take on, you know, what about the aerosol bit? What about ventilation? What about the other? That's new. Anti-authority, anti anti-politics. Anti and I think that's as much on the left as on the right. If they're all liars, what does it all mean? Even the battle about Manchester is a kind of variation on that. Who has the right to say and to say what? And all kinds of scapegoating reliant on older myths of race, class, maybe disability. And that means we're kind of got this highly variable and of, often contradictory responses to state wanting both more and less intervention or intervention of another kind. And I think that's kind of, I don't know where to place myself with that, that, you know, you can see it, even the, and, you know, terrible old Gove is able to say with some justification that you others who are resisting are not being consistent because you say more lockdown, but not more lockdown here. What does it all mean? Be tougher, be less tough. Tell me more, tell me less. The next one. So, of course, and this is always the thing I want to talk about now, alongside solace, survival and liberation, is that in that place where there's not meaningful authority or trustworthy authority, but there's also realistic danger, there's always a risk that new and other authorities may arrive. And I hope what we'll talk about, perhaps after a break, is what then? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Darby. Um, I'm just unsharing my screen. <laughs> Hopefully, that is just about unshared by now. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the slides. I'm so sorry I couldn't make it work my end. Of course. Um, <laughs> Teams is an endless nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, amazing, uh, very intense, and um, I think it, although the, the subject matter is incredibly dark <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, I think that it also is being incredibly careful about where and how to think about solace uh, and liberation. So I hope we can pick up on that um, after, after a break. I think at this point, it would be great to take 10 minutes so maybe come back at 20 past uh, so that everyone can take a take a breath, gather their thoughts. Um, when we come back, we'll start with uh, Jana and Danbeer to open up the Q&A and then we'll open it up to uh, anyone else who'd like to share. So, um, yeah, thank you so much again. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's get started. I think uh, probably most people are back by now. Um, thank you so much again uh, for that incredible talk, Gargi. I think. Um, it, as you said, it's it's such a hard moment to think, but uh, so wonderful that you've taken the time to to think alongside us, and I think that was incredibly rich and just such a powerful, uh, such a powerful provocation and talk. Uh, so as promised, um, I thought we would uh, turn it over to our respondents, uh, Jana and then Dan Beer, to uh, to come in with a, a comment or question. Um, do you want me to go first, Jana? Yeah, Dan Beer is going first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is agreed beforehand. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you, Gargi. Um, you know, I don't want to go over the usual platitudes you get with a talk, but you know, it needs to be said that there was there was there was so much going on in there that I did, you know, write a couple of pages of notes of of possible um, um, or questions to kind of or avenues to pick up on so I've, I've just pinned it down to two and they're kind of i've tried to turn them into questions but if they're not i hope they're enough of a prompt to kind of um to to generate some discussion so i'll just i'll just go through them both and then you can deal with them as you as you wish and um the first relates to that to the discussion uh the the, the discussion you were having about the racial capitalism as a term and the work that the term's doing now, especially kind of in the in, in after uh, Cedric Robinson died, and the, it, certainly in the UK, his his death wasn't really marked in any in any way whatsoever, which is possibly to do with you know the reception of the book when it was first published, and it kind of almost completely went unnoticed, and even the second reprint didn't really um, do much work, but um, 
Yeah, I was interested in how you're talking about how racial capitalism has become a kind of fashion, and as a as a, as it's become a theoretical fashion, it's also become a, a become a kind of uh, it being emptied out. It's being kind of hollowed out from the inside. And there's a whole host of other terms that um, you know are kind of that's that's similar stuff has happened to. You mentioned intersectionality, and the other obvious one being decolonization. And I was thinking about decolonization and intersectionality and racial capitalism, particularly in relation to um, something I heard on on one of these recorded online talks now that happen all the time that uh, Gayatri Spivak say. And she was talking in reference to decolonization, but I think it's it applies to racial capitalism and intersectionality. And she goes, well, the problem is, is that people are using these terms without doing their homework. Um, and that's the that's the main problem here. That's how the hollowing out process is happening. And so I wanted to kind of talk about homework and what kind of homework means. And I was really taken by what you said, that, that line, the comment um, you made about any great tune that we work on, we need to keep that we made. Sorry, we need to keep moving on. And I'm wondering if that's a useful kind of uh, metaphor or way of thinking about homework. So homework, not as something that stultifies or fixes or canonizes but something where we're always rethinking and 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 reworking terms and that's the way we kind of um stave off the 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 um the dangers of becoming a fashion and and being stripped out from the inside and the other thing i wanted to ask about i was really taken up about your your idea of people's desires in moments of um of the, the seeming difficulty and the seeming impossibility of thinking. And often you get the desire, usually on the left, of to, to, to go looking for old enemies. Um, and to kind of identify, oh, this is Thatcherism rehashed, as you said, this is X or Y rehashed and, and re, re, reworked. But I also think what also seems to happen in such moments of crisis, of, of the seeming impossibility of thinking, is we also go looking for old heroes. And I'm wondering what the stakes of going looking for old heroes. So um, people go, you know, someone like Avtar Bra at the moment or uh, a group such as OAD and Stella Dadzi are being talked about a lot, especially amongst young activists. Or um, even personally, I've, I've started teaching a new module where I'm just kind of saying to, to students, all you're doing for 10 weeks is reading Stuart Hall. And I'm not really telling them why. I'm just saying you're reading this stuff. Because right. I can Unless, tell you, that's the authoritarianism I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly, yeah. Um, and so I'm thinking about, again, a, a, another old hero um, being um, Cedric Robinson mm. that people are turning to. Mm. Um, and because you mentioned these three these three things that we need to hang on to, solace, survival and liberation. And I think that's a key aspect of Robinson's analysis in black Marxism and in his analysis of racial capitalism, which that hollowing out that's happening at the moment always misses the bomb, always seems to want to set aside. And I think the name he has for solace, survival, liberation is he calls it the ontological totality, the kind of the thing we're living for, the, the reason we're, we're resisting and the reason we're, uh, we're uh, insurgent at this level of intensity in, in these ways. So again, I'm wondering that what happens, what does solace survival and liberation feel like or what do you what do you what do you intuit that it might feel like in this kind of current guys what might an ontological what is the ontological totality that we might be defending and trying to kind of make sure we survives this this crisis I'll, I'll i'll leave that there for now should i talk or not i'm not sure what you're is it both is Jana going to talk now emily or I I don't know, emily you, you look. Yeah. I mean, if it if it works for you, I would say maybe um, it would be great to respond to Dan Beer and okay, that, yeah, okay, I'll do that a bit complexity in, in just that much, I'm sure. Okay, I've already forgotten what the things are. Oh, the hollowing out of racial capitalism and how um, the devil will always steal our best tunes, which I think is a key lesson for the left, and it's partly a key lesson for the left in the way that. Um, any phraseology that we come up with that is meaningful to people can be repackaged and sold to us, stripped of its politics and as a commodity. So that we already know that. But there's also a way in which 
the difference between the general political urgency to just get a handle on what is happening and people's wish for a shorthand can militate against. I think thinking always requires a bit of um, sitting otherwise, a kind of discomfort, a kind of shuffling in your chair. And because you know things are urgent, I think racial capitalism as a phrase feels so commonsensical that people feel like as soon as you hear it, oh, yeah, of course, I don't need to read any books. I know it. But when I think of homework, you know, I like reading books as, as much as anyone else in this room. But I don't think. Um, I don't think the reason that in this country terms like decolonization are being institutionalized for evil ends is because people didn't read enough books. I think there's a an active political project which is about saying I want to achieve something different. These terms can be repurposed for that other thing I want to achieve. What are the people who said them first going to do? We're even going to get some of them to come and work for us, to be that thing. What are they going to do? We pay the wages, they pay the bills. So that so it's not only about knowledge, it's about how languages of liberation function in a highly commodified landscape where even knowledge is also commodified. Now, I used to think that one of the good things about racial capitalism is it was less amenable to commodification. And I still think naming capitalism is not as easy for capitalism to commodify as many other things. But still, I don't think, you know, we know loads of universities, including the most horribly racist, horrible places no one would ever want to be in. Let's not name them because lots of us have worked there or are still working there. Now, themselves have got the brass net to be hiring people to do decolonizing work for them. I can only say swear words in response. Now, that is not about not reading books, is it? That's a politics. That's an institutional politics. So there, there are different kinds of homework going on here. And I don't think our resistance or unsettling of that institutional politics that is happy to use any tool against us, including our own tools, can be unsettled by us doing our homework better. If it, it, whether, and I was also going to say, for me, homework is also trying to do things with ideas, not just reading about ideas. Now, the thing that makes it harder, the thing that makes racial capitalism harder to unsettle is that it has a real street life. People are really mobilising around what the lessons of thinking of the world as formed by racial capitalism can be. That's much less amenable to stripping out of meaning. But it's there's still a difficulty about the conversation across different segments of people, some of whom just heard the phrase and feel like they know what it means. Some people are kind of halfway in the world of books, halfway in the world of street politics and kind of trying to make it work. People who are over here thinking, you know, why do you need to reread it again? We've got the analysis now. Let's go with the program. It's fine. something different going on with those things. So. But in terms of the broader point you're making, I do kind of think that that. Somehow we need to think of analytic and political language as an ongoing process of creativity and that that is part of the, of the pleasure of solidarity with each other. So instead of saying. You give me decolonization, I trump that with racial capitalism, or I outlefted you, which I'm sure we've all been in that conversation. We instead say the beauty of speaking to each other in a way that can share something that feels like solace or the tools of survival as we innovate a language together, almost the musical language of what it is to hear the tune and make the tune something slightly different in the iteration between us in this moment. That's partly what our collective resources might look like. And I know I sound old as the hills, but I have to say I'm very, very old. So everyone have to just accept these old as the hills talks. The other part of what you're saying about. So that comes on to the other thing about thinking, looking for heroes. Of course, people look for heroes and heroines because when life is scary, you hope that there's someone who will come and save you. But I like to think that there's a tension right now between what I think of a kind of conservative small C of looking for heroes, like someone will save us. And a different kind of way of thinking, which is that if there are resources of solid survival and liberation. They're not made by any one generation any more than they're made by any one location or any one identity group. And I'm most interested in what it would mean to really curate intergenerational conversations, sometimes with writing, but very importantly with people 
in which we listen to each other, not in a way that one of us knows and the other doesn't. And that can work both ways, can't it? That the old can say, I've been through it before. Or the young can say, you old folk don't know. I, neither one of those works. But instead to say that there's some, that if there are resources of solace, they must be made between us, just as the musical innovation of changing the tune slightly must be made between us. The conversations between us in the different places must belong in the space between us and be made between us. And that's, again, much harder to com commodify, strip of meaning, make not ours, because it, it's made in commune, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I like to think that some of this kind of this um, anti-racist nostalgia fest kind of the, of the moment is partly that will, because you suddenly hear intergenerational again. Six, seven years ago, you say intergenerational people don't, kind of didn't grasp what you're talking about. But now people say, oh, yeah, that means not the young don't kill the old big difficulty on the left for a long time that you come in and say you old fuddy duddies you've been losing this same way for a long time the first thing i do is kill the father maybe more lately kill the mother so don't let's not repeat that but equally let us not repeat our own kind of internal authoritarianism where people want to say at last I've got old and I've lost every battle, but at least I get to tell the young comrades what to do. You think, oh, no, what is that? Let's not do that either. So some kind of attempt to learn what a to and fro would be, which looks at what our shared resources are, both locationally, generationally, and many other ways. Mm. And I think that's, see, I'm not into totality. I know you're right that, you know, that's in, that is Robinson's view. I think Robinson writes beautifully but I wonder how many laughs you'd have with him. That's a terrible thing to say. I don't know. I might, I might be wrong. I always think that about all writers on the left thing. Yeah, I met would him this once. Be, was, if you had to him. ride in a bus for a long way to have a fight, street fight, would these be the people you'd want in the bus with you? I'm, maybe. I, met him. I think Cedric Robinson, maybe. Because I met, I met him, him once. I, I met young. him once and he was good fun. Yeah, and I met him once when years. I was very young. He was kind of quiet, but could have a laugh. I think, yeah. you know, I think these are ticks. People should, yeah. some of them should write a guide to leftist thinkers who can <laughs> carry themselves in a street fight, who can make the room laugh. So they're important um, comradely yeah. attributes. Definitely, yeah. But I'm not so interested in creating a language of totality. That you know, I think we might have to accept that solace, survival, and liberation are not achievable in the in the same moment for us because of the horror we are facing. And that part of the things I'm saying about bridging gaps between us and innovating between us are about saying, let's not move too quickly to totality, because we've seen the left do that. And what happens, you know, that leads to the, all these other things we've been talking about. Instead, let us try to develop in a more modest way. What are the first things that's worth trying to think about? Even if you and me could have a song about solace that changes some previous song, Maybe we're not yet at the point we can talk about liberation or someone else, some other, you know, that that. And I think part of the insight of racial capitalism is saying, even though Robinson is longing for totality, it's maybe not totality yet. And that what it is to mobilise, knowing that not totality yet, that's really that's a big. Tactical and conceptual shift for the left to try and think that. And that's what I think the real meaningful street politics of the take of racial capitalism is. And I better not answer every question so long-windedly, although there are only two, but so I will try to be better next time. No, thank you. That was great. Thank you. It was, yeah, it was so great you answered Danvers' question and mine. <laughs> I can have a go because I had quite a few anyway. Yeah, I just wanted to e echo Danvir and just, um, you know, also just the privilege of, of having you here tonight in the midst of all of this, um, given, you know, this amazing book that you've written and, and other articles in the meantime, but while at the same time being um, you know, a kind of legendary trade union activist, which we didn't talk about at UEL and other places. And I think it really needs to be acknowledged that that's a, a part of your intellectual and um, political labor. And it's it's um, been inspiring for many of us. So but I wanted to um, talk about uh, just, you know, this question of like, what do we do in this um in this landscape that this kind of new landscape to die in. And I think, you know, these kind of 
profound statements that you made throughout, which are, you know, just um, tragic and upsetting in some ways, but like naming the reality that we're living in and naming the moment, um, which is, has been so crucial about your talk. Um, but I wanted to, yeah, just think about what you were saying. It is sort of linking a few different things that came up in your talk when you started at the beginning to talk about the hollowing out of racial capitalism, but also the endless production of analysis and, and kind of narrations of the pandemic and the kind of like frenzy of, ac of intellectual activity that was being produced. And then what you said about, you know, performances of competency um, and the also that kind of... Um, you know the moment before this one, which, which to some extent, in the in the in terms of subjectivity, we're still in that. You know, like so, and somehow subjectivity is there where when everything is changed. You know, and so this kind of idea that you know many people still remain in the, in the kind of endless frenzy performance of competency. If I'm if I just do this, if I just appease the students, if I write three more books, if I you know I'm just I'm going to survive this moment of total negligence and punitive you know reality, and how you know there's just this total disjuncture between those. Um, endless performances and that frenzy and what's happening and, and the violence and it, to some extent on the level of subjectivity is that that we keep going we keep doing it as though everything's the same and our and our the world we lived in is falling apart you know and how do we how do we bridge or move away from the mode of subjectivation that asks us to endlessly perform into the one that we're in right now and I wanted to pick up something you say in the book um, in the racial capitalism book about two things that underpin racial capitalism. I mean, you say lots of things do, but, but these two in particular, one, which is um, desire, you know, and the, the desire to, um, to engage in relations of expendability, you know, and also the reproductive labor that, that goes into upholding racial capitalism. And so I wanted to add, there are two different things, but I wanted to ask you about, about both of them. And so on the one hand, there's a question about, you know, I'm gonna quote Spivak also, but um, the, her kind of idea of the uncoercive rearrangement of desire, like how might this be a moment where we think about how we uncoercively rearrange desire from the competency framework, which was fueled by authority, but also by desires to please, you know, I mean, we're, that, that's what it mobilizes to a certain extent, certainly in the university. Um, uh, maybe in other places, it's, it's less so, you know, the work we did on migration, I wouldn't say, you know, it's necessarily mobilized a desire, um, apart from the desire to actually be able to live. <laughs> but, but, you know, in the university, there's something underpinning it, which is which is a kind of desire. So I'm, on the one hand, I'm thinking about in terms of subjectivity, what, what is that work we have to do right now of the uncoercive rearrangement of desire mm -hmm. to get to a point where we actually work on solace, um, mm -hmm. uh, survival and liberation. And then secondly, I wanted to think about just like, the kind of complexity of where we are when we think right now, because we are also in the home, most of us, many of us in homes. And how do we, how, how that, while we feel like that is a kind of a point of division, that that also might be um, open up a possibility as a condition that we can sort of share that allows us to think about those issues to do with survival in a much more um, inhabited and embodied way. And so how can we use reproduction as a as a framework for um, unthinking and uh, fighting racial capitalism, as much as it's been used to uphold it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, two questions, lots of other things to say, but <laughs> but no non-coercive rearrangement of desire. And I love that kind of phrasing because um, well, you know me already, so you're already, not everyone in the room knows that that I think part of how we need to think about languages of liberation have to be ways that that speak to desire and the will to pleasure and, and and the will to lose yourself and not you know that so much of the competency framework is to be a more and more bounded subject until you're bulletproof whereas desire is something different isn't it desire is giving away desire is losing the boundary and so that's desire and solidarity they're 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 close bedfellows and we don't always say that in this country anymore and, you know there's a longer history of talking about that but if there's ever a time for us to talk about it again, as you're implying, now must surely be that time. But it's tricky, isn't it? Because all the things that are making people be kind of vulnerable to the authoritarian call also seem to militate against 
a non-coercive rearrangement of desire. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but fear is not a good terrain. To have to be neglected and made endangered, this is not a good terrain for the non-coercive rearrangement of desire. So there's something about what, how we reinsert that language of what it is to feel safe in non-bounded ways. And I wonder if, you know, I don't normally talk about safety, but there is something about that, isn't there? What what are the conditions that allow me to not to both imagine and, and then act on my desire, which is a giving away of self? And that might be a quite helpful thing to think of as a collective project about what because it's not this. This is not that you know, this this is if there was ever a terrain for people to be having bad and dehumanizing sex, this is it. Feeling really, really, you know, you know, everyone is terrified and lonely and fearful and they think we're going to die soon. But that is not what I imagine when I think of the liberatory moment fueled by desire. So there has to be something that we say about what, um, how to re-narrate what the need for safety is in a way that is collectivised, that registers desire, that allows other ways of thinking of what safety might mean and practising it. And I think that might come on to what you're, I think you're implying about reproductive labour. And of course, reproductive labour is neither one thing or the other. Is it? It's just the thing that cannot be, cannot be ducked. You know, that somehow life must be remade. Otherwise, when you're not even hitting the survival ticket. Of course, we know that all of the ways that life has been remade that we can think about lately are vulnerable, just as our be best tunes are to being coerced, commodified, taken from us, our best love taken away as if it's just a remake, profit somewhere else. Um, I say love, you say reproduction, you know, that these things, that that's our reality. And yet, because the basis of life is so dependent on reproductive activity, which maybe we should not always think of as necessarily labour, because the labour is the structuring of the moment, when we're free, I still think life will be remade. I just think it won't be remade like this. So that what, what are we learning in this moment of absolute neglect about what the terms of remaking life are? And that's both within the home and beyond homes and across spaces, isn't it? And I think that leads back to the, the longing for intergenerational connection is partly that. What is it to remake myself that is beyond this um, tightly bounded productive unit? It's linked to the wish wish to be not only myself and a non-coercive desire, and it's linked to all of the experiments in mutuality and care and a whole politics of survival in the face of structures of authority which pretty much, much say, die, why don't you? All of that is a kind of creeping, um, clawing back of some aspects of what we think of as reproductive labour, I think. And I think you're right that that's one of the terrains. Of course, it's not decided, but you can see that where people are crawling, lifting their heads a little bit, that's one of the terrains right now where they're doing it for all the reasons that I think you're implying. I hope I'm hearing right of what the conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting. I'm just wondering if there are any questions from the floor at all. Um, if you'd like to pop anything in the chat, please feel free. I'll keep my eye out. Um, I see Yurella has made a comment about desire as a giving away rather than wanting to get. Oh, and I see there's a question from Sarah. Sarah? Hello, thank you. Um, I just have to ask a question because I just really, really, really love the talk and actually feel energised listening to a talk for the first time in really a couple of months. Um, I actually, it was really interesting what you were saying about like, um, you know, not even performing competence, like performing non-competence and how this contributes to an environment in which you don't feel entitled to answer ask for any accountability because it's, it's um, foreclosed. The possibility of accountability is foreclosed. So like, thank you so much for that illustration of that because I've been thinking about it. But I still have like, uh, I'm thinking, or oh, I'd really like to hear 
what you think about like how people are feeling about that right because you do seem that see that kind of like meme culture around for example you know going to the going to do it breaking the um lockdown to go and get your eyes tested and, and whatever like you do sort of see like you know the rumble um but um i'm just wondering because especially at the beginning of the talk that's how that's how you sort of took us in right was sort of like through the feeling um and then and then you kind of get to what's going on in terms of like uh you know neoliberalism and the state and everything would you, like would you be able to say something else further about like then the feeling and like our capacity to respond um yeah I'll try but what I have to say about that is miserable so I'm hoping I'll say it and someone else will say something better what I think is really dangerous about this moment is this double structure of feeling um which kind of seeds two parallel strands of anti-democratic trajectory from deeply and genuinely felt emotions one is um so on the and i actually think that this predates covid and was kind of set in trail through brexit so that you have both sides kind of collaborating despite their um tension with each other in a kind of discourse which delegitimizes the possibility of meaningful democracy. Not the democracy we have, but even to be able to think what democratic accountability is. So now we're in this moment where one side are fearful and are kind of saying, you are a terrible government because you cannot wield your absolute authority well enough. You're, you're also um, a rule breaker and a liar, but the real issue is what we need is a better, more authoritarian government than you. You're so right wing, but you can't use your authority properly. More cops, more cops. Can't you go? I saw some people in the park sitting down. Haven't? Can't you get the cops there? And anyone who's been in a mutual aid group in the last 10 months or so, oh, we went like from two weeks of who needs some milk to, oh, I saw three boys running in the park. <laughs> How did that happen? So there's that. One of them is, and and some of that is on the left or the centre about this state is dysfunctional because it cannot wield the authority of the state properly. Equally, on the other side, which is, I think, a mixture of the right and the left, people who feel fearful, confused, either think this is not really happening or what's happening is a conspiracy and they're not telling us what's really happening. You can't believe anything. Don't follow any of the rules because it's all it's all the lizard people or it's all it's all big pharma or it's all someone. Again, kernel of truth in that, isn't there? But these these rules do not fit this situation. Therefore, I want to say again that this, um, any statecraft is just um, a fiction of the elite and that there is no room for accountability. I don't even want to engage. In fact, I'm going to go to anti-politics. I'll either go to the far right or if any kind of um, five star style people want to come into Britain, I'm ready for it. Come, come. Give me a new populism because... God knows the populism of Johnson, that's not doing it. Both those kind of trajectories, which are not legitimate, but they're understandable kinds of articulations of fear, mm. seem really dangerously near to fascism to me. Mm. I've said it out loud. See, that's what I really, of all the many things I fear, mm. the fear that this is what the moment before the real start fights happens feels like yeah I think that's possible I don't think it's decided but I think maybe we should speak to each other as if that's a possible and how would we speak to each other seriously if enough of us thought maybe that's what's happening oh, I'm sorry that's like no one can sleep at night once I say that so someone else tell a joke well, quickly you now. Could, maybe if someone or someone else who's in the convert in the in here well, maybe I mean like why why is it still undecided maybe you know like what because I mean it sounds like it's such a banal like point, but I'm trying to think of like counterpoints mm -hmm. and I w I'm thinking about the sentimentality and of course like the NHS clap was the worst like the best and the worst example of that display like mm -hmm. the first time they did it I have to say sorry but I did have tears in my eyes and mm -hmm. I know it's terrible but I'm just like responding on that emotional level mm -hmm. that you haven't really sort of seen that it was a very it's a big gesture right it's a powerful gesture 
And then, of course, you know, that's like just after the voting in of this government again and Brexit and what's going to happen to the NHS, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, yeah, what keep what? But then it's like, is that also then going back into a sort of nostalgic or out of time politics to think that some of the terms that keep that undecided are to do with things like, well, people are really into the valuing the NHS now or something like that. But no, and I can see what it's, and I kind of feel that 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 sentimentality that that's a dangerous moment, isn't it? An undecided one. But you know, that's what that's what the bit before. The fascistic crowds in the street looks like you know sadly but it doesn't mean that that's decided but i think there's something i think all of us of goodwill need to find a different way to speak about this moment than how well or not well is state authority being deployed because once that becomes the terrain of discussion we're already having a discussion about what kind of authoritarianism do you want, which feels to me like the only politics in town in Britain right now. now that feels like how did all of us, none of whom are framed in that way, get onto that? And that's and that's partly what Jana is saying about um, the subjectivity and the subjectivity authority is all, of austerity is already there, isn't it? It's already set us up to be that. But that's a dangerous moment when people of goodwill think they're political choices and interests are circumscribed by a set of discussions about what flavour of authoritarianism do you want. So I think part of our job is to kind of shift that with each other. You know, even for us to have this conversation here is like saying, you know, how did we get to that? That's, that's not any of us. How can we move that slightly? But also, I think we need to learn how to fight. I'd just like to say as well and I've been doing a lot of physical training in lockdown and I'm old I really advise you all learn to run learn to fight do a lot of press-ups because that will be useful as well thank you um thank you for that question Sarah um, are there any other questions out there uh down there yeah, so I just wanted to kind of fo uh, uh, follow up on that flavours of authoritarianism thing and wanted to ask you your thoughts on how uh, about the kind of, I guess you'd call it the problem of labourism and this kind of attempt to kind of, that tends to happen on the British left to kind of push any popular dissent into the frameworks of the Labour Party and how that seems to just, just be a historic problem that we just never seem to get over, but I don't know. Uh, and the and the often those d discussions come about, you know, and the, on the eve of the election, which Corbyn almost won, he still said, "I want ten thousand more cops or something on the street." And and if you were, if you somehow object to that, you're somehow kind of some sort of um, leftist ideologue stick in the mud. And that seemed to be kind of yeah, that, uh, an alternative flavour of authoritarianism. Mm. I'm just wondering what your your thoughts on that. Are. No, absolutely, and and of course you're right that there's all of the ways in which the penal state is so embedded in um i think not just here but certainly here ideas of electoral polit political possibility that's part of it so people are already schooled into that like as if you could just make the state work in the right way and the state is a, a big set of boots and maybe a bottle of milk maybe two bottles of milk but you know that's pretty much what the state is i wonder if we've moved on at least for some for generationally moved on even in because that's been a, such an escalated period since the first near Corbyn, you know, Corbyn near hung parliament in terms of a popular understanding of popular, not everyone, but popular amongst lots of people. And if you think like people under, I think even people under 40, certainly people under 30, such a strong resonance and kind of um, almost kind of an um, intuitive understanding of what defund and abolish might mean and why. In many different spaces, unexpected spaces, not only in big urban spaces, across ethnic groups, but that's a kind of, you can't put that back in the box. 
you know, a few of them will want to be president of NUS, but that's going to be a minority. The rest, it's like that's part of that generation's subjectivity. And then that's already having a kind of ripple out of what can be done or not. I think it probably does mean that the Labour project such as it is, is just not, it's not the meaningful project for some time. But I think people already thought that. You know, I think, he, again, with friends of mine who I write with, we're all saying none of us were people who um, would centre our energies in electoral politics, but all of us could not, and I phrase it in this way, could not refuse the slim possibility of Corbynism, of the bringing together of a broader political agenda of liberation with um, the kind of pragmatic politics of statecraft. However slight our hope was with that what kind of gesture is it to say i'm not even going to try that slight hope you know we all have you know the vast majority of the freelance left who went out and pounded the streets with almost no hope but this tiny bit of hope of what you would shift in not that you'd capture the labor party but what you shift in terms of how you might think of the relationship between street liberatory politics and statecraft which is still a battle, it's just not a battle that you could play in the Labour Party right now by being in the Labour Party. Um, we couldn't refuse that, I think. And now I think politics around penality and policing and state violence can't be turned back. That doesn't mean we've won it, but that conversation about cops on the street just cannot be had in the same way that it could be had even three years ago. Mm. I, I don't think, not with, not with the younger half of the population. So that, yeah, that's the game, isn't it? And then we're back to intergenerational conversation, what solace means across boundaries, making a new tune. So um, we are nearing the end of our time. I was just wondering if there's anyone who hasn't had a chance to raise their question yet. Um, I know you rather had a comment about desire as a giving away rather than wanting to get, um, which uh, was part of a, a thread from <laughs> sort of several threads ago, I guess, at this point. Um, and yeah, was there anyone else who had a question or maybe Yurvella wants to pick up on the desire point? Um. I, no, I just thought, I just think it's such a powerful idea. I think we've been very used to thinking about desire in terms of getting, accumulating, wanting. And um, that sense of this, there's, there's such a, a sense of risk where, you know, when you're in scarcity, the, the knee jerk thing is to to want to gather stuff to yourself. And I think there's something incredibly powerful about this sort of gesture that's moving in this opposite direction but the other th I suppose the other thing I just wanted to say was I think this is really important again I, I'm really grateful to, to Jana as well for reminding me because that for ages I was obsessed with that the Spivak quote about the non-coercive arrangement of desire and I, I do think that there's something about the work of artists the work of aesthetics that's not necessarily in the kind of activist declarative mode but is there's that sort of working because I think things don't happen it's not because we don't have the intelligence when I was brought up you know with things like racism my dad would always go oh they're just ignorant you know and you you, you live in hope that that's true but it's not sometimes it is sometimes it's not it's much more to do with we simply don't want to you know we don't want to change. It's something much more to do with the heart than it is to do with the intellect, I think. And that's why I think there's something about um, activities, th the things that somehow get at the heart, get at that almost un that terrain that we often we we almost can't even name, you know. And that maybe we have to get at in all sorts of like. I loved what you said about these. Is it the, is these like small gestures, these humble gest gestures that can maybe slip in through those cracks? So yeah, I was I was massively inspired. I know that you are talking about hard stuff, but 
I, you know, I, I just thought what a, what a, what a joy to listen to this. I think it's, it's just been incredibly inspiring. I'm glad we've re- we're recording it. So oh, it will be there for us to maybe come and reflect on again. Can I say this one thing that kind of in response to what you've said, and it's a line I've been peddling for a little while, and I hope a short piece will come out by it, but it's, it's a political lesson. It's not an analytic lesson, really. But I've been trying to peddle a line which says that revolutionary consciousness and solidarity is when we start to fall in love with each other again, which is, I think, a version of what all of you are saying. And I think rather than leave you by saying, yeah, I do think fascism is around the corner, but I also think this, the possibility of us falling in love with each other again, the whiff of it, even if it becomes a broken promise, that that's what that's what that's when we that's close to ontological totality. But it's a bit more romantic version of that, (laughs) isn't it? When we and you and we all know what it means, but not. Not to fall in love one, with one another in that hungry, as you mm. say, kind of mm. grasping way, mm. but to be in the space with others and to feel yourself fall into the totality again, into the, the mm. bound. Yeah. That's unbeatable, isn't it? Yeah. That's what class consciousness is. That class consciousness is not selling a paper in a corner. Class consciousness is when you are me and I am you, and I love that I can't tell the difference between us. So please take that away. That's better. It's not love, <laughs> but it will yeah. sustain you for some days. And me too. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been oh, fantastic. What a wonderful couple of hours. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for coming. Yes, and see right. you in a couple of weeks time for the yeah. next one. Thank, thank you so too. much, Gargi. And thank you. Oh, thank you. What a, what a beautiful note to end on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Woo!